Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre. With me is Z. Uh, a bit of a slow week last week. Uh, not too much happened, really. Uh, we have a few exploits and some stuff from Hack in the Box, though, which I think will be some interesting stuff to get into. Um, again, though, we, we will probably be going shorter this week, uh, more than likely. Before that, though, we have a discussion video dropping this week, Thursday at 8 a.m. Eastern, uh, continuing with Druhi talking about getting a job in the industry and the formal qualifications involved with that. Uh, with that out of the way, though, we can jump into some of our news topics. So Black Friday is coming. Uh, it's coming up this week. Um, some sales have actually already gone up on various websites that I've seen. Um, Z, I know you had some some interesting stuff to bring up uh, when it comes to sales for, for Black Friday. Yeah, so last year we actually did a blog post about Black Friday. I don't know if we're going to do that again this year. I figured just on here I'll shout out a few different resources that should have deals or possibly do have their deals up. Um, on the software side, VMware I think is a big one to look for because it is a fairly expensive piece of software, but I mean, if, if you're like us, you run a lot of VMs, VMware is pretty much the best option out there. I, um, I love it. It is one of the few things that I would recommend people like seriously buy, even if they don't do like, even if they're only running one VM and they don't need some of the pro features, like being able to run multiple VMs in parallel, um, snapshotting, for example, is just such a damn useful feature to have. So yeah, I, I, I really recommend that show for VMware as well. Yeah. And I mean, in fairness, like VirtualBox, um, Hyper-V, they all do have snapshotting also, but generally speaking, just like, v oh no, I haven't had too <laughs> many issues with Hyper-V. But um, Hyper V is what I've kind of been using since going on to Windows Pro. But um, yeah, so VMware is usually on about 35% off. So it's a pretty significant discount. Um, Shodan, I don't know whether or not they're going to do a deal this year. They often do like a lifetime membership for like $5. But last year they ran their sale before and after Black Friday, but not during Black Friday. So you kind of had to be paying attention to actually get on it. They ran an anniversary sale before, and then they had something on Reddit after. Um, so I don't know if they're going to do one this year, but they they have been pretty consistent about offering some deal around Black Friday, so that's something to keep an eye out on. Uh, moving on just into, like, training stuff, though. Pluralsight almost always has a deal going on, like 40% off, I think, just on their annual passes. I'm kind of a fan of Plural Site. It's not the best when it comes to their security content, but you need to get up to speed on a new technology stack. I think it's a great resource for stuff like that. Uh, Cybrary.it, 67% off. They're kind of on a perma deal right now. They've been on sale like through COVID stuff, uh, saving like $600 off their annual billing, bring it down to... Uh, Oh, now I can't remember how much it is, but it's pre again, pretty significant. Um, INE, if you're not familiar, they recently bought eLearn Security. So all of the eLearn Security courses are now available through INE under their cybersecurity pass. That's normally $2,000 a year, 40% uh, off. Personally, I, I don't think it's worth it, but I mean, if you like that ELS content, you do get access to the labs, you do get access to all the videos at effectively $100 a month on sale. Um, and that's ongoing right now. And there are a few other places. No Search Press usually has a deal uh, on their books for 42% off. Pentester Lab at 13.37% off. Um, O'Reilly Online Learning um, actually has a fairly good deal in the past where they'd have, a, have their online learning platform for $200 a year. Um, I... So you don't get ac or you get access to more than just the O'Reilly books or that and O'Reilly content, uh, Singress, Wiley, No Search Press, a ton of their books are all on that online learning platform. So if that's something that interests you just to have an access to a huge library of tech books at, at $200 a year, it's pretty much worthwhile, in my opinion. Um, and lastly, Pentester Academy, uh, they have a deal running at... Um, sorry, they're the one that has had the deal running kind of all through COVID. They're at $250 for the year, 70% off. Um, 
I will shout out I, a lot of their content's more focused towards pen testers rather than more exploit dev that we focus on. But they do have one, well, two courses, x86 assembly language and shell coding and x86 64 assembly language and shell coding. And oftentimes, I know Spectre, I don't think you have a good recommendation on this site either. When it comes to, you know, learning assembly, but not really going towards the developer resources, which aren't the greatest when it comes to exploit dev, like you kind of want to learn more of the raw machine code. And then one of my main recommendations has been uh, the open security training x86 courses, which are just extremely dry and just cure the instructions. Um, this course from Pentester Academy does seem like it strikes a good balance from the people I've talked to who have done it. I've not reviewed it myself. So it's something at least to check out. I don't recommend it just because it is a little bit costly on there, but on discount, like I said, 250 for the year, that isn't a bad price. And it is at least some intro content to get started with. Their exploit dev stuff isn't that great, though. Yeah, so uh, like you said, when it comes to assembly, it's it's hard to find like good resources for that. It's it's something you you basically have to learn by just jumping in and doing it and getting familiar with it. Um, though I will say on that open security training course, I think I found it less dry than than you might have found it. Um, I, I there was definitely some like interesting things I learned in that that I thought were cool and I never knew about before. So um, there there's definitely stuff you can learn from that course if you know somebody out there is listening and wants to learn assembly. It is still worth checking out, I think, uh, especially the first day. The, the second day does get a little bit, um, I, I kind of tuned out a little bit when it came to the second day, but the first day had a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, yeah, it's definitely it... a fair course. I just, and it is still kind of my recommendation, despite what I'm saying, like it teaches what you need. It's just, I didn't find it terribly engaging myself. Obviously, other people have different opinions. Yeah. Um, when it comes to the deals you mentioned, um, I think the first three are probably the ones that I would say are are like more attractive to me than all the other ones you listed. Uh, VMware, like I said, I, I just love using VMware. It's it's a daily driver for me, so paying for that is is kind of a no brainer for me, and and it's really not that expensive. Um, even without the deal, I think it was like two hundred two hundred and fifty dollars. Which, I mean, you gain access to that that version, you keep it. It's not like Adobe crapware where you have to pay yearly to maintain access to it um shodan is another like I, I bought that one just because it's it's five dollars for a lifetime like you said i i don't even really use shodan i don't really do thread intel stuff but just the ability to have it for such a cheap price you might as well get it um i did have a question around plural site though I, I haven't actually checked out plural site in a long time i don't know if you have um I was just wondering if you've heard anything about like their security content getting any better, if there's been like more stuff added since like uh, a year ago, for example. Um, Cause I know at the time when I looked like a year ago, there was like two or three security courses and they were mostly around like Windows stuff, which isn't really my area. I think um, Yosevich has added a new, um, another course on there. So he was one of the guys behind uh, Windows internals, like seventh volume here. Um, he just worked on the first the first half of that. Um, he's not working on the one that's yet to be released. Uh, I think he's got some content on there, which is pretty good about, but that is Windows internal stuff. Um, I don't know too much if there's a lot new. I mean, Pluralsight isn't really focused on the security aspect. It's more for learning the technology. It's more oriented towards like IT and developers. Yeah, uh, I, I will quickly go off topic there and say uh, Windows internals. I think that the next version of Windows internals is going to come when. Uh, it's like the Cyberpunk 2077 meme. It just keeps getting delayed and delayed and delayed. Maybe we'll get it before 2025. I guess we'll we'll have to see because uh, I, I feel like that book was supposed to come out this month, wasn't it? There was some. Yeah, like, I actually release date. I just went and pulled off um, the Microsoft press store to see see when it's now dated for and now it's dated for february 2021 <laughs> uh so, it, yeah, it is literally the pushed. cyberpunk 2077 of books so awesome. still eagerly waiting for it for years one day we'll see it but today is not that day <laughs> all right 
So Oracle um, had some funny, there was a quick funny story around uh, CVE 2020 uh, 14750, which was an Oracle no off uh, RCE. Now, I couldn't find too many technical details of it, it, but it seems it was a path traversal, I'm assuming on a file upload. Uh, I couldn't really confirm that, though. I went looking around and, and didn't see much. And uh, the, the few screenshots that are in the Twitter chain are in, uh, it's like a screenshot of a write-up that's in Chinese, I think. Um, so if, if you look at the credit page, though, for the CVE, this was where it gets funny. Uh, there were like 20 groups that were credited for finding and reporting the vulnerability. This is like meme levels of collision. I don't think I've ever seen that much collision on one vulnerability before that was listed in a statement like that. Um, what was probably even more of a meme, though, was the patch. Because somebody shared a screenshot of what they what the patch is, and it's supposedly they create like a blacklist of illegal strings to use in the URL, and it serves a 404 if those strings are in there. And some of those strings that they check for are like semicolons, uh, dot dot, um, percent two e percent two e, which is the encoding of dot dot, um, lesser and greater than symbol stuff like that. Uh, and it seems very flimsy and bypassable. In fact, there was somebody in the Twitter thread that said. Uh, this took all of 12 minutes to bypass. So um, not only was there was it such a simple issue that so many teams found it that there was like 20 uh, teams that collided, uh, it also wasn't fixed properly anyway. So, yeah, this um, is one of those cases. I mean, I've mentioned this before, especially if this is, it, if this does reach its way to being a file path, I mean, I've mentioned it a ton of times, don't do a blacklist. Uh, just resolve what the actual absolute or canonical URL is going to be, or sorry, path is going to be. Resolve that and just compare the front of it. Make sure it's inside of where it's supposed to be. That's going to catch every case of trying to traverse out by just going through that step. Whereas trying to do the blacklist, you know, you've got to think of absolutely everything if you're going that route. Oh, I don't know. Like in this case, perhaps you might even be able to get away with just lowercase. They're only checking for the uppercase versions in this case, but I'm not sure if they normalize at some point. But yeah, the blacklisting like this is just always a bad idea. It's like one of those classic sayings, and, and I actually, this is true for another story that we have later on in the podcast. It's like trying to patch a sinking ship with like just patching holes in a sinking ship. Um, you might as well just get a new ship or rebuild it because like this, this code, this kind of, you know, slapped on solution really isn't going to do much. Um, it, it, it might deter some attacks. It, it's almost like uh, security through obscurity in that way. It, all it's doing is maybe deterring some people, but somebody who actually looks at the code and understands what it's doing is, is going to be able to just walk around that. So um, but I mean, this is Oracle. I feel like Oracle is not the that doesn't have the best reputation when it comes to fixing issues. They're kind of like Adobe when it comes to uh, their awesome fixes. So I'm not sure what people were really expecting there either. I guess. Um, so FileZilla, FileZilla had a buffer overflow that was posted on Hacker One. It was a buffer overflow in the theme settings. Uh, they have a setting for the scale factor for the theme. And uh, there, there's no length checks on it or even any integrity checks on it, it seems. Um, well, because... it, so it, this is where I think the reporter's wrong. Um, hmm, okay. So t if you take a look at this, they say it's a buffer overflow attack. In their repro, they even include like controlling EIP, like giving it the X42 or B for EIP. But look at the number here. It is, in order to create this, so first of all, this is a user-induced attack. Like, you attack yourself with this. You go into the edit menu, you go to settings and themes, find the scale factor, and you paste in what this thing generates three times. So you're pasting in roughly 15 million characters. Um, so what the uh, tree author says, is that it looks like a user-initiated crash due to stack exhaustion where the stack just runs into the guard page, which makes sense given that it's 15 million characters going in there. Uh, so I imagine this is just the crash. This isn't exploitable. They don't show any proof of being able to exploit it. The capture there doesn't show anything. Um, so I, I would kind of lean on the side. This is just... Um, this is just a stack exhaustion issue. It's user-generated. Like, this is super low risk. I'm actually surprised that FileZilla even pays out for this. 
But I did yeah, go and look I at their. Too. Yeah, I went and looked at their rewards though, and they do mention under low they pay out for memory leaks and crashes as a result of user action and user initiated infinite loops. So they pay out for these really low issues. Like I, this isn't really an exploitable issue. Like even if this were a stack overflow and you could get EIP from it, like control, even if it had that, this is a user attacking a user land program. Um, like you're not elevating privileges at all. It's not remotely accessible. It requires the user doing this to themselves. Like really low risk. Like I can't think of a real viable exploit strategy here, unless it's something like you have whitelisted programs and you use this to inject yourself into FileZilla, which is whitelisted for some reason. Yeah, so I was I was gonna kind of get into that too, um, because it seems like the author really tried to make this seem like more of a big deal than it is. Like you said, it's it's a self exploit. You're not privilege escalating unless you're running FileZilla as like admin or root or something. And if you're able to do that, then you're already an admin. So you're not privilege escalating. Um, though, as much as the exploit doesn't really get you anything, and it's probably not really exploitable. The issue is does seem kind of weird because what I was going to get into earlier was the fact that uh, not only do they not do any length checks on that field, they don't even do any any integrity checks on it because it, it's a scale factor. So it should be a, a decimal or a float value, um, but apparently it doesn't even restrict to just floats. So it, it's it's just weird how they parse that. It might that happen field. later. It might happen yeah. if they actually go to use it. Oh, yeah, like, I don't know. I don't it know. just seems like a weird issue that I can't really think of how you would write code that would lead to this type of issue. But oh, um, I mean, you just have a text box and you save the text box value. I mean, that's all they're doing. So, yeah, it is kind of like not doing anything yeah. else. But they're I would assume that when they go to use the value, then that's where they might convert it and make sure it's the proper format or something. But in this case, because it's such a large value that's been created, it just exhausts all the memory space. Okay, I, I could I could see that when you pointed out that way, I, I could I could totally see how you would. Uh, you taking, can see it that uh, way. Taking one question out of chat, uh, free SRX uh, asks: Do companies on Hacker One have to release the findings once the bounty is claimed, or can it be unreported indefinitely? And they definitely don't have to uh, release the findings. We spend a fair bit of time, or at least occasionally, we'll look at some of these reports that either don't have a full disclosure where they'll only have a little summary statement released um, or sometimes even speculating just about having no information but the title um, and they don't even have to release that much um, it's they basically um, if you want to disclose in this case you could see the author here ask the question you know can I disclose and then they have to kind of agree to that disclosure uh, so it's up to the bug bounty program to actually disclose the information or not Unfortunately, I do think that information should become public after a certain amount of time, and I think Acker One's in a great position to enforce that, but they don't. If you want an example of where you can find a bunch of bounties that you will probably never see the light of day, um, Valve. Uh, if you go to the Valve bug bounty, you will see many issues that are either undisclosed or they're partially disclosed. There are a few you know, diamonds in the rough that are, are that are full disclosure, but they're very rare. Um, so un unfortunately, it seems when I look around on Hacker One, there are probably a, if you were to take like a survey, I would say there are more reports that are undisclosed than there are that are disclosed. Um, and, and that's just the nature of, of companies just not not having really any incentive to open up those reports. Um, like like you said, I, I, I do kind of wish Hacker One provided some kind of an incentive for that. I don't know if I would say that they should force companies to eventually allow reports to go public, but maybe, I don't know if they could provide some kind of financial incentive or or some kind of reputation uh, incentive on the company to open up those reports, but I mean, reputation that's, could that's be up to a them, good one for the company. Um, I, we've kind of had this talk before. Uh, just about what hacker one can do to improve the state of things rather than just being in the position of facilitating the bug bounties, which is what they do right now. They could be in a position of facilitating the growth and like maturity of the security programs of these companies. Say their first year, they don't necessarily have to do much, but then, you know, after two years or after three years, they're focusing on, well, you have to disclose X amount or 
Uh, you should start paying out for issues or things like that. Like there are certain there are steps that they can kind of lead companies along to continually improve their uh, kind of security posture rather than just enabling it on whatever they want to do. But at the same time, they're a company. Um, they're going to want to just, you know, let their clients do whatever they want using their platform. So oh no, I think HackerOne is just in a really good position to like improve security globally. Um, but I understand why they don't. On stream, I have also pulled up like the Hacktivity page and just sort of this by new and everything. And you can see like the first three newest ones here disclosed over the last couple of minutes have no title, no information about them. And then we've got like the U.S. Department of Defense, which censors everything out, but gives a bit more information and then a bunch more without any reporting. To be fair, uh, a lot of the reports that I've seen that do get disclosed, they don't get disclosed immediately after the issue is marked as resolved. Um, sometimes it can take like weeks or even a few months for uh, the, the company to want to disclose that information, but they do eventually. So some of these that you're seeing here could potentially be opened up at a later date. They're just they're just not yet. Yeah, I'm looking at just the latest activity, <laughs> which, like I said, um, usually does take a little bit of time before you get there. But also just trying to show like, yeah, there's there's a fair few that just don't disclose. Yeah. So moving on, we have a PlayStation bounty that was uh, disclosed. Not the type that uh, people probably hope for, though. Um, it's it's not a like a kernel bug or a user land entry in a console or anything of that nature. It's a misconfiguration in the My PlayStation endpoint for transferring OAuth access tokens um, from the server. So it, it seems kind of weird. This issue was a little bit confusing to me and how it worked. Um, it, it seems like they allow you to pass a target origin in the request URL. Um, and that's used when you use a window request type. And there's like no restrictions on that. So you can just specify an, a target uh, origin in the URL and just get the OAuth token sent there. So by crafting a link with the window request ID prefix and the malicious target origin, you can just spoof the client on that server to perform requests on their behalf. Yeah, kind um, of. Um, so we've talked about this sort of issue a few times. Uh, that is... This is one of those issues that relies on using that post message function to send sensitive information back up the chain, back to whoever actually opened this. So um, in this case, they kind of have the two case, the iframe or the window. Um, and yeah, they just, they read what the target origin should be right out of the URL instead of having any sort of hard coded checks on it. So that's where you are correct. But yeah, it's, this is just another one of those post message issues. Uh, when they get that, um, when they get that OAuth token, they're just sending in a post message right up the chain to the window.opener and just saying like, hey, here's the token. Um, and they pass the origin right from the URL because they do need to know the origin to pass the message over. Uh, you can't just do an arbitrary one. Uh, so in this case, yeah, it's leaking that OAuth access token. Um, and it's all based around not checking the actual origin and whitelisting the origin. Make sure you're sending it where it's supposed to go. So this was rated as a high impact issue, and he ended up getting a, a $1,200 bounty payout, which at first I, I did think was low. Uh, but when I looked at Sony's payout table, their payout for PSN issues is a lot lower than the console specific issues, because the console issues, uh, when you're looking at the high impact here, is $10,000. So I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised there's such a discrepancy, because I would think PlayStation Network would actually be more of a pain to deal with in terms of uh securing it and worrying about potential attacks because if you're hitting like psn like in this case you're dealing with like account hijacks and there's probably more like legal mess around that too especially with like gdpr and stuff like that whereas a console most of them are like self-attacks for things like jailbreaks like nobody's really writing malware that's going to write on consoles. So it just seems weird to me. It's, it seems kind of backwards. You would think that PSN would have the higher tiered payouts than the consoles would. I don't know if you would agree with that sentiment, Z. Um, but it, I don't I know. Mean, some of it comes down to the overhead on it. Because um, you've got like the overhead on attacking the console. Usually, I imagine you're looking at the binary level issues. And I do yeah. think it is worth mentioning here. Actually, I just saw this looking at the PlayStation activity page. Uh, it looks like two different people have reported this, and the other one got a $1,000 bounty. Oh, interesting. 
Interesting. Um, I never saw that. The either. other report here. Looks like they were both reported very close in time. Double check that. Oh no, this the one that got paid more was reported quite a bit earlier. They just were both disclosed close in time. It's interesting that they paid out on both of them. Because yeah, this one here, the report that I looked at was uh on March 16th, 2020. And then the other one was November 20th. Uh but yeah, they're both reporting the same issue. Wait, sorry. Uh November 20th? I'm seeing a different date. I see reported that March 22nd. Are you maybe reading the disclosed date? Oh, yeah, I am reading the disclosed date. My bad. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just Catch. wanted to make sure. Okay, so March 16th and March 22nd. So actually, it's not that far apart. Yeah, they were actually reported pretty close together. That's, uh, that's interesting. Um, it's interesting that one got $200 more than the other. Yeah, I wonder if, if Sony even put the like two and two together and found out that those were like the similar issues or not I don't considering know. they're disclosed around the same time i'm gonna assume that they did yeah, i don't know that's weird uh, that's um, but yeah looking at brand, so. like the flow looks like he reported five months ago maybe we, i don't remember if we talked about this one i know we've covered some stuff from the flow before but um oh i did the, the, that's the one i did the streams on oh so. the, that was that one right yeah yeah, that one was, uh, we covered that one more than any other x <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Um, but that one was a $10,000 bounty. And so that's kind of what I was saying. Like, I think, I think the reason PlayStation pays out more on that is just because the binary has kind of that higher, higher level to actually, or higher barrier to entry. So they kind of have to be a bit more enticing than just web issues. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a valid point. Um, I could see from their side, too, how they would be worried if they paid more for the web issues, that they could be flooded by those web issues because of that. Uh, that they being still pay more pretty accessible. decently on the web issues. Oh, I for mean, sure. I mean, like a thousand boxes and like it's, it's maybe not Google levels of pay or Facebook, but it's definitely way above normal. Yeah, I mean, Sony is one of those bounties on Hacker One that if, if you're looking for something to target, it, it might be in your best interest to look at it because it's one of the higher paying uh, programs that we've seen. So like Valve is another good one, although they take like uh, 15 years to resolve reports. Um, but, you know, Valve pays out highly and, and Sony is another one that uh, might be interesting for people who want to do some bounty hunting. So, yep, might want to keep that in mind. Uh, we'll move away from Hacker One though. Uh, we have three vulnerabilities in Citrix uh, SD-WAN. So we, we meme on Citrix a lot, and everyone memes on Citrix a lot. Um, in their defense here, it seems like they kind of got bitten by an odd behavior from KKPHP, which is the uh, the framework they use. So getting into some of the issues, the first issue is an unauthenticated path reversal in the stop ping diagnostics endpoint in the collector's functionality. Uh, they, they allow a request ID to be passed in uh, to read a temporary PID file. And they just concatenate that string in there and don't do any sanitization on the input. So that gives you the ability to uh, get a arbitrary file write. And uh, that issue, uh, combined with a weird behavior quirk from Cake PHP, uh, results in the ability to get RCE. Um, because even so though that path I, traversal exists, um, I I'll jump let you on go ahead here, and see. Sorry. Um, that path traversal is more than just the file write. I'm actually, I don't even think you get a file right from this. You, you're able to upload files they mentioned using the collector licensing upload endpoint. Uh, but the stop ping, you get the path traversal, which tells it what file it will read, and then it uses the contents of that file directly in a shell execute call. So that means you're basically able to include shell commands. If you're able to upload a file containing shell commands, you can point this stop ping towards it, and it'll read that file and execute whatever's in there. So their example is using that upload functionality to upload your own file, which you can then use with stop ping to get uh, code execution. Um, and then the second issue, the config editor, is another place where you can get a file that contains some uh, shell commands in it, uh, which is how they kind of get the unauthenticated version, because the second issue is an authentication bypass. I wouldn't entirely agree with you on saying it's a weird thing about cake PHP. It's it's an intended feature. Uh, you uh, the way cake PHP works here, 
is you're able to define your routes as being like whatever path you want to take map that over to a function and then the parameters in the url are going to be used as the functions arguments which is fairly standard like a lot of php frameworks do something like this where they will convert a url and parameters into a function call uh, so in this case where the issue comes in is they have this auth parameter which really it effectively is saying is the user authenticated or not so by default it's false but because of cake php you can just include auth equals true with the url and it'll flip that flag and pretend that you're authenticated even when you're not the intent there is that it's going to be used internally only like internal function calls might call this function just tell you that we're authenticated and move on uh rather than going through something uh rather than going through uh whatever functions it calls it just calls this higher level access one um so i don't think it's that weird that cake php does it i think it's more like citrix probably should be aware that all of these things can be called um if you're using cake php like you can do that and that's part of why um like you even use cake php to do that routing in the first place is to create that direct connection between the url and what function it's going to end up calling and there's a lot of fun bugs that can end up coming out of that such as this one when people aren't really thinking about that aspect but i don't think it's that weird that this happens it's definitely pretty common among a lot of php frameworks uh, but yeah you basically just set auth equals true in the url and you get an unauthenticated access uh to the config editor um, oh. and then they have oh go ahead um did you want to get into the third issue because i had something i kind of wanted to jump back on so i'll let you continue yeah, if you want to i was just going to go with the third issue create azure deployment shell injection user supply data gets json encoded and concatenated or appended right onto a execute call uh in this case it calls like sudo python 3 and it includes the deployment data that json that it encoded includes that just wraps it in some uh single quotes of course, JSON doesn't use single quotes. You always have to use the double quotes for that. Uh, so if you include single quotes in any of your data, you're just breaking right out of that and able to inject your own content, uh, which gives you kind of the full chain. You don't even need that last one, just those first two issues. Do the auth bypass to get to write a config that contains uh, some shell commands, and then you stop ping pointed at that config file that it wrote, and you've got unauthenticated RC. So I think there's a bit of confusion because there's actually two um, kind of issues that they bring up that are related to Cake PHP. One was the one you just talked about with uh, the routing. I was actually talking about a different one though when I was talking about Citrix kind of getting bit um, because uh, mainly with that first issue. So I, I will also say thank you for pointing that out. I don't know how I got that mixed up in my notes. I, I must've got it mixed up with a different issue thinking it was an arbitrary file, right? So yeah, sorry, it, it um, like you said, it, it executes the commands given in that file. Um, but the endpoint that they use, the diagnostics endpoint and the collector's functionality, that actually got protected uh, by Citrix, I think because of a previously reported issue. So they tried to block access to it unless you had a signed certificate, um, and that was enforced in the Apache configuration. But where they kind of got bit was the fact that Cake PHP has this silent behavior where it'll strip the beginning of URIs if they contain a question mark after the colon slash slash directive, um, presumably to strip out protocol information or the authority component, as it's sometimes called. I don't think there's like an official name attached to that. Um, but what that leads to is a discrepancy between how Apache sees the URI and how Cake PHP parses the URI and passes it to controllers. So it's almost like a, a smuggling issue there. Um, because, and that's kind of an important part because if that didn't exist, uh, the initial RCE, uh, would not be able to be hit because you would need that certificate to be able to even reach that endpoint. So that's where I was kind of talking about cake PHP kind of biting them, I think. And I, I looked yeah, through the and documentation that's... and I didn't see any mention of that behavior. So it's really weird. Yeah, that that's a fair point. Actually, I had kind of just jumped right down to the actual CVs and was, didn't, put as much attention on this first bit there but that is a good point um a little bit weird that's at least not documented that it does that i think it just kind of comes down to trying to do a little bit of normalization yeah um, i agree yeah i mean that's a that is weird behavior though yeah so the authors asked the question of whether or not 
um, that specific issue um, should be pinned on Cake PHP, um, saying that it like I think this behavior should at least be documented. Which I did take a look through Cake PHP documentation, and you know they do have various warning boxes attached to certain things. But uh, when I looked at the routing and stuff like that, I didn't see anything about this behavior. Um, I feel like Cake PHP should at least document that. Um, and because I think it's reasonable for people to implement protections and authentication at the web server level, that's a pretty common thing to do. So the fact that the cake PHP is going to end up parsing those those URIs different than what the web server sees is is kind of a big deal, I think. Um, but yeah, so it seems like there's there's a bit of a split blame here. There's some blame on Citrix because these vulnerabilities are kind of silly, but also um, there's that weird behavior with cake PHP, which people really need to be made aware of, I think. Yeah, the, the phones are silly, but like you said, uh, implementing the authentication at the, the reverse proxy level, basically, is commonplace to add some security mechanisms there. So having this discrepancy that isn't documented does feel like I'd want to place some blame on Cake PHP. Although it does depend a little bit. I'd have to look into how they did their Apache configuration. Um, which they might have in here, but I'd want to look into that a little bit. Uh, but no, it looks like they're just seeing the location match, looking for the collector, so... That seems fair to me. Like, that seems like how you would generally do it. So yeah, I'd want to place blame towards KPHP, given what I'm looking at right now. Yeah. So, I'll end this topic off with a bit of a fun did-you-know fact. We've covered six vulnerabilities in Citrix through the lifetime of this podcast across three episodes. Uh, I just thought I'd bring that up because that is kind of impressive. I don't know if there's any other things we've covered that we've covered six different vulnerabilities in uh, over the life of the podcast. So, you know, well, we did have Bitdefender last episode where we had 10 vulnerabilities in one, but, but I, I know mean, that's like, not quite what you mean. Yeah. 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 Um, but um, yeah, at least in this case, Citrus can be forgiven at least a little bit. Uh, next up, we have a vulnerability in RenderTron, which is an open source application for dynamic rendering, which fetched a $5,000 bounty. Um, this post goes into some background of the architecture of how dynamic rendering works and when it's used. Um, from what I understand, it's, it's basically used for web pages that need to be indexed by crawlers like Google, for example. So for those crawlers, it generates a static HTML page, which can be parsed using a headless browser. And then for real users, it generates that dynamic, fancy JavaScript page for the more reactive user experience. Yeah, I feel um, like this post went into a ton of background that just isn't relevant. Because the actual issue here is just that it's an SSRF. Yeah. That's the core issue. Like, it doesn't even really matter about all this rendering stuff. It doesn't really matter at all. You have a render ten issue. Uh, you're able to... Uh, you find the back end to render ten, so you're able to make like the same API call to tell it to pre-render something or to render something, sorry. Um, and you give it a location uh, to like uh, the metadata endpoint to get uh, cloud keys or something like that. Um, what I did find, so I will mention with render ten, uh, prior to one dot one dot one, you can basically make any request um, until three point dot zero. Google Cloud endpoints were blocked, but you could still hit the beta endpoint, so you could still get, you could basically get around it. Um, on 3.0.0, uh, you just use an iframe to load the internal endpoint, so it only protected the main request. Uh, so you'd request a page that used iframes, and 3.1.0 now finally has whitelisting to kind of specify specific domains to hit. Uh, but the, the issue is kind of clear. You give it the domain or you give it the URL. It makes a request using the server to a server-side request forgery. The fact that it's uh, doing all this rendering is kind of irrelevant to the actual issues. Until you get into the pre-render where I thought this was kind of cool. So using pre-render rather than render 10, um, there's no UI to hit. So they have this example UI of render 10 that kind of makes it really easy to know if you hit the right endpoint because it gives you the UI. Uh, render 10 does, or uh, the pre render aspect or functionality doesn't give you that. But if you just try and hit the render endpoint with the URL parameter, 
you can find things out. And it uses a WebSocket to communicate with the headless browser on a hard coded uh, on a hard coded port of nine two two two. So by making a request to the uh, like local host nine two 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 slash JSON, you're able to find out what the Chrome's debug ID is, and then you can make your own page that actually communicates with the headless browser yourself. So I thought that was kind of a fun trick to get around. Um, or basically to get access to this headless browser, and make it do whatever the heck you want. So again, more general SSRF issues. Uh, it's interesting they wouldn't use an ephemeral port for that, but um, yeah, I wonder what the what the reasoning is behind that. Um, with, with the rendertron issue, what I found kind of interesting was the fact that they used the they abused the screenshot functionality. So with rendertron, you you have two um, APIs that are accessible to you. You have the rendering itself, and you have the screenshot, which does what the name suggests it takes a screenshot of the page in question and that's kind of how they ended up abusing the ssrf to extract the tokens um they used like a some iframe trickery to end up getting those uh, the the json for the access token printed and then they would screenshot that iframe i thought that was kind of interesting um because you don't really like screenshotting is kind of a weird functionality that i didn't really expect although it definitely makes sense when you think about it like um, that you would want to be able to take a literal screenshot of a website uh, at a point in time. So, but that that was kind of a cool feature that, uh, at least to me, uh, that ended up getting abused. Um, once they discovered this, they basically scanned for applications that had a public bug bounty that also used RenderTron, and they ended up finding a product that was vulnerable. They don't disclose what product that was. Uh, they kept that vague and replaced the technical snippets with vulnerable site. Um, so, you know, for obvious reasons, they just, they don't want anybody to know what company they hit, uh, probably don't want to have to deal with like reputation damages or something. Um, but what I like about this post is it's, it's not a bug that's specific to one thing. This is kind of a, it, it's something you can look out for anywhere that's using RenderTron. Like if you're doing an assessment or something or an internal security audit and you're using RenderTron, the, these are the types of issues you can look for and you might end up having, you, you might end up finding and having to deal with. So it's it's another one of those uh things you might want to keep in mind, you know, if you if you're doing uh security reviews, I think. So, container escapes. I love talking about the container escapes when we have them. They're they're few and far between. So this post is, is an expansion of a container escape technique published by uh Felix Wilhelm last year which utilized control groups uh release agent functionality. Um, to execute commands in the host environment. So that original POC abused a feature in cgroups, which was the notify on release um, feature. And cgroups is used basically to isolate Docker containers. Um, and to facilitate that notify on release functionality, it would use a release agent file, uh, which basically contains a command that gets executed when the last task in that cgroup leaves. And this command is ran by root in the context of the host. Now. The paths um, that you use in the release agent file have to be relative to the host file system because it's ran in the context of the host, which means you have to find where the files of your guests reside relative to the host on the on the host side to have the ability to be able to execute it. Um, so where this gets interesting is the way that Felix's original POC did this was they parsed the container root mount point, um, the root mount point through the etc mtab file. Um, the problem is not all file systems expose the host path in that file. Uh, so, for example, they say overlayfs uh, does expose it, but something like 9pfs, which is used by uh, Kata containers, doesn't use that file. So what this blog post brings new to the table is the ability to exploit that old issue, um, but bring it to situations where you can't parse that root mount point to get the host path of the container through that method. Um, and to do that, they use the proc um, special file endpoint, specifically the root symlink that exists in the proc uh, pid directory. So by using that in the release agent file, which executes commands, um, you can use the symlink to access your full path of your container without actually needing to know the full path. Um, as long as you know any pid of any process running inside of that container. And that's really not a high bar if you know how pids work. Um, pids are basically just incremental 
So all they had to do was enumerate. They, cr they create a file and sleep in the container. And then from the host side, they enumerate through all the PIDs until they find the file they created with that root node. And then they can execute the command they or execute whatever they want um, as root in the host. So classic, like, this is a really cool container escape that I actually, I didn't know of the original POC at the time that it was published. Um, so that I I like that about this blog post. It kind of showed it out in the fact that I was unaware of. Um, but that issue itself is older. It's it's from 2019. Um, but it's cool that it's been refined in this manner to make it more exploitable on on more targets. Yeah, it's more exploitable. It does require you have some privileges. Um, so like the original one, like it's an escape. Uh, at least how Felix reported it's escape when you actually are running a privilege process. A trail of bits did a write-up that goes into more detail about the original write-up to figure out exactly what uh, capabilities you need, which I think it was just you need sysadmin as the capability, which is a bit of a high ask, but it's not unheard of to run some of these more privileged containers anyhow. But you do need that in order to register this release agent. So, you know, it's not useful for everything. I do like the fact that he went and used the proc for this or use the proc file system for this because i really kind of i don't know parsing the m tab just seems like it's i mean it, it is a hack but it feels hacky it feels kind of like a sketchy solution uh whereas using proc pin just feels like it would be so much more stable and consistent to use and i mean it would be because it's available in more areas uh, so i i like this solution to that problem it's more elegant Yes. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, that's that is a good way. Um, but yeah, like sometimes people see an attack and then they try it, and if it doesn't work, they just call it a day. Um, they don't try to see if it can be made more useful than it was originally suggested to be in the initial proof of concept. And um this post kind of breaks that pattern and um it shows how powerful sim links are, dude. Like I think people greatly undervalue sim links. I mean, we we've seen a lot of like junction based attacks and windows and stuff like that but even in linux like there's so many situations you can be in as an attacker that sim links can be like a godsend so and this is just another one of those so we'll move into our last exploit of the episode um or actually i guess this is more of a research post uh modern attacks on the chrome browser so it does focus on one specific exploit but it gives a lot of background on uh chrome um, especially when it comes to deoptimization. So I'll let you get into this, C, because um, uh, I, I think you you got you have a better summary for this than I do. <laughs> yeah, and, and summary is kind of the key thing here. This is definitely one of those things I want to I wanted to point out because there's a ton of background included in this write off. It goes into like basically this is knowledge that I just don't have when it comes to the internals of V8 and. You know, this was definitely a tough write-up to go through. We actually, we talked about dropping it just because neither of us are really all that knowledgeable when it comes to the browser exploitation, uh, like on V8. Uh, that said, I mean, there's a ton of really good information in here. So still want to call it out and at least give a shot at summarizing some of it. I apologize to the author if I get some of this wrong. I'm giving it a best shot, but it seems like this comes down, as Spectre said, de-optimization or... Really two processes come into play, obviously the de-optimization and the optimization. So optimization, when you're converting that bytecode, the V8 bytecode into machine code, um, at that point, it might make some optimization assumptions. Like if you make one call with a, like a function call with a bunch of, sorry, with the same argument a bunch of times, um, it might optimize that machine code to use that argument in a hard code way. And then it might need to de-optimize that when you make that same call again using a different argument. It'll notice that its assumption was wrong and it'll reverse that process. And de-optimization, it goes from the machine code and it recreates the bytecode and puts it back to using that bytecode. So de-optimization requires knowing a little bit of information about the original code, things like where it actually was located. Um, and there's this frame state information that includes information like the parameters, the registers, accumulator, context, outer frame state, closure, like there's just a bunch of information in there that the de-optimization might need to access. Uh, so that data is created either during the optimization or before that. Um, and one of the key things that it does during that is it'll 
propagate truncations. By that, it's like, let's say you have like a 128-bit integer. If it needs to be truncated at some point down, like to use this like a 32-bit, it'll trace those truncations and track that. So it tracks the restrictions on that value node. Um, so in particular, one of the things that needs to be tracked is the accumulator. Um, and that actually needs to be tracked kind of um, one of the comments here says the accumulator is a special flower. We need to remember its type in a singleton type state value node as if it was a singleton state value node. Basically, they need to do some extra tracking around the accumulator in particular because it just gets tagged as like it can be any tagged value. Um, so if you get something in there that shouldn't be there or if you don't track that correctly, it'll incorrectly recreate the accumulator. And that's where the bug comes in here. Um, in some cases, it's able to kind of lose track of what the proper type for that accumulator should be. So when the deoptimize, when the deoptimizer comes to that value and tries to convert it back to the bytecode, uh, the bug ends up misinterpreting that accumulator, uh, which should be a, um, I believe it's a big int as a U int with n bits. So whatever size end up getting truncated to. Uh, rather than converting it to that, though, it ends up thinking that it's a pointer to the data rather than the actual value itself that it should have. So it rematerializes this big int accumulator as a pointer, a user controlled pointer. Which then you can kind of create two gadgets out of that, um, which is kind of where I thought this was more interesting because so many of these browser bugs kind of require these issues that, you know, they don't directly give you anything. You've got to do more work in order to actually find your gadget. So in this case, you basically, you control the value that gets passed into the actual opcode. So the uh, bytecode interpreter sees what the opcode is and then just gives it whatever the arguments were. So you control the pointer that's used for that. So they use the case of de-optimizing on like an add operation or basically any of the math ops, it'll load a heap number value um, using this arbitrary pointer. So whatever heap number value is at that pointer, it'll just load that. I'm not exactly sure what this heap number value is. I believe it's a box number that's on the heap, but Googling load heap number value gives me this right up. So, <laughs> It not not insanely helpful, but it seems like it's basically just numbers like JavaScript object numbers stored on the heap. So you're basically able to read numbers, but you're not able to leak pointers with this. It's not quite like a arbitrary memory read. So it's not not the most useful gadget. But the second one that they came across was when de-optimizing on doing a variable or sorry, doing an assignment to an object field. Uh, when you de-optimize on that by just making a bunch of function calls using the same attribute access, um, and then you make another one that breaks that assumption that the optimizer made that you'll always be calling it with that attribute, um, it'll cause it to de-optimize where you control the pointer being passed in. That means that you can store an ar arbitrary object reference to any object property, kind of like you craft your own arbitrary object in memory if you chain this a few times and have a memory leak to have the proper pointers to use. Uh, which is kind of the key thing here. You do need the, you do need an info leak in order to really chain this or something. But I did think that was at least an interesting approach of using this subtle issue of it, not quite tracking the accumulator correctly, leveraging that into what well, you can craft custom objects. And in theory, you can craft that into an RCE. So jumping back a bit to what you were saying about the boxed heap numbers, um, I, I forget what you call them already because it was such a weird name. Um, but I, I imagine what it's like is, I, I think it's similar between WebKit and V8 and probably all browsers, is you have like a JS value type. So the integers that you use in JavaScript, they're not actually stored in the internal state tracking as like a, a raw value. It's, it's called a JS value. And basically the, the upper 32 bits of that are used to track what the type of the value is. So if it's like, if the upper two, uh, 32 bits are zeros, um, I believe that denotes that it's a pointer. 
uh, if the upper 32 bits are between zero and um, like the max value, that indicates that it's a um, double double wrapped precision float. And then if you have Fs all in the upper 32 bits, that means that it's a uh, it's it's just an integer value. And what Z was kind of saying there with with being able to read, uh, not being able to read pointers, but only being able to read uh, raw numbers. Uh, the reasoning for that is that upper 32 bit tag that is internally managed by the engine. You shouldn't be able to at least um, influence that tag from uh, like the JavaScript context. Um, but yeah, I, I've done some browser exploitation. I've dabbled in one or two WebKit exploits, but this one is is like more weird than most because it's dealing with a bit of a weird machine, right? You're dealing with optimization and deoptimization, which in and of itself is like a really complex subsystem. And then you're talking about a browser, which is already like a behemoth when it comes to complexity. So that's why I was like, it's hard for us to cover this part, even though I have done browser exploitation, because most of the browser exploitation I've done has been in like JavaScript core, um, which is compared to this area is relatively simple. Um, so yeah, this is like a really complex subsystem. And that's kind of why we wanted to shout it out too, is that um, it's not, it's kind of rare to get these really deep, like research type insights into browser stuff. So when it does come up, like we want to get it shared around and and seen. So yeah, and you hear you heard it here. Uh, JS Core is relatively simple. <laughs> get that printed uh, on a um, T-shirt. <laughs> this one does include uh, some references at the end and actually earlier on to other resources to dig deeper into it. Um, so yeah, it, it has a lot of background for you, a ton of stuff that can help you understand this. Like I said, I don't have a full understanding. I did think, like, I kind of understand how it's going from corrupting some of that input data into using that data somewhere that actually giving you a useful gadget, but I don't entirely get the truncation process there and what exactly went on there. But if you wanted to, this looks like a really solid write-up. Doesn't look like this guy posts too often. This is his first post of the year, unfortunately. Um, but it does look like he does some uh, conference presentations. Like this was supposed to be for an Infiltrate Con 2020 talk. But just as a side note, really awesome conference run uh, in the first quarter of the year. Uh, has it been canceled, given the fact that he published this? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. So Infiltrate 2020, I don't think was canceled. I think they ran it online. I was going to say, like, it, it would make sense if they ran this online, but then why would he post this? So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe something we can dig into. Um, but yeah, you kind of touched on this earlier, but browsers are so awesome when you're talking about exploitation because, um, like you said, almost every issue that you encounter in a browser will not take you directly to like code execution or arbitrary read write. Browser is all about um, continuing to escalate your primitives of corruption. You're using your corruption to get more useful corruption, which then in turn gives you more useful corruption. And then after like three or four stages or sometimes even more than that, you get to that arbitrary read write. So Browser bugs are very powerful because of how useful corruption is because they're such such complex beasts. Um, but they don't immediately give you like put it this way, you'll never see a trivial browser bug. When you see a browser uh, researcher calling a bug trivial, they mean it's trivial as far as browser bugs go. You're never really going to be able to understand a browser bug unless you like dig into it or are already familiar with how browsers work. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's its own world. And that's why I think it's, it's so fascinating. So yeah, always good to get insights on that. So we'll move into hack in the box. So, uh, there was a hack in the box presentation at, uh, UAE 2020, which happened last week. Um, and it was on, uh, jailbreaks never die exploiting iOS 13.7. So all we have here is uh, slides for uh, Hack in the Box. I believe the presentations, like the VODs, go out about a month afterwards. Um, at least from what I could see with previous Hack in the Boxes, that's how it's ran. Yeah, um, it looks like some of them are already available, actually, but not for the main track. Uh, like yeah. ComSec track, uh, the workshops, they're already available, like just the direct streams. But unfortunately, not these main talks just yet. But I am looking forward to seeing a couple of them. For sure. 
Um, so yeah, first up we have this iOS based one, uh, jailbreaks never die. The slides go over the iOS sandbox and its various weaknesses, um, strategies for finding sandbox escapes, and some vulnerabilities related to the AVE video encoder component. So I think for me at least, the background was a lot more interesting and informative to me than the exploits and the issues themselves were. Yeah, definitely. I I like this one. I think I even linked it to you mentioning like I thought it had a really cool overview of the exploitation process, choosing where you're going to target. I didn't care too much for the actual walkthrough of next play, just the intro, the overview, I think was really well done. Yeah, especially considering all we have here are slides, like we don't even have the context of the of the voiceover. So the fact that we were able to get such a good overview from the slides is, uh, it's like a really strong uh, indication of how good these slides are, I think. Um, but one section that I, I wanted to point out was uh, when you get to slides 41 and 42, because um, it, it kind of challenges the the common opinion of Apple with Apple just being a god at everything when it comes to security. And Apple 40 or um, <laughs> slide 41 challenges that. Um, they have a slide called Apple is slow. And it basically says how Apple is a slow responder and has failed to fix bugs before uh, in one go and they let regressions happen, which we have talked a little bit about over the year because there's been some regressions that have happened this year as well. Um, and um, the the other slides that I thought were cool were the uh, the list of daemons. I think it's a, a few slides underneath that. Uh, yeah, slides 47. They have like a list of daemons that are accessible from the sandbox. Um, and they have like a diagram which lists the routes of attack for getting to kernel. So hitting like direct to kernel from sandbox or escalating to a less restricted sandbox or, you know, just chaining further to eventually escape that sandbox to be able to hit system services. Um, and the the reason I like those slides that I highlighted was it, it highlights those two misconceptions that I think are common. Uh, for one, I, I, the one I already kind of touched on was the fact that Apple is not unbeatable. Um, they have weaknesses, and uh, these slides kind of highlight those weaknesses. And the second one is you don't have to go directly to kernel from Sandbox. Um, it seems a lot of people think that you, you just want to go directly from Sandbox to kernel, which obviously would be awesome if you could do. But as time goes on, that strategy is probably going to become less and less viable um, because as time goes on, that sandboxing is just going to become stronger and stronger. It's just going to be locked down more and more. Um, and I don't think people realize that attacking other daemons to increase your area of attack surface is still a good strategy. Um, it's more work for sure, but it's also less picked over and more likely to have bugs and more exploitable bugs. So it, it's almost like you're trading off difficulty from that vulnerability research side and you're offloading it to the exploit chain. Um, so you get a harder exploit chain, but you get an easier time finding bugs, which I, as time goes on, I think that strategy will become more and more attractive. And uh, these slides kind of demonstrate that, I think. Yeah, I think we actually talked about this from the perspective of Android recently, uh, where we talked about ex or we talked about a research paper that was covering... Um, Android, Android. I think it was system damage. Yeah, yeah. Covering those is kind of your stepping stone to your actual kernel vulnerability, using uh, those services to uh, get access. So, I mean, it, it's definitely something that's getting noticed now a little bit. Uh, it's the same thing though across both iOS and Android is taking that stepping stone, like I said, adding a little bit more work on the exploit chain in exchange for perhaps easier exploit finding or easier vulnerabilities. So one thing I remember you mentioning uh, that kind of caught your eye in these slides was the fact that the presenter mentioned the fact that they were a, uh, a Zoomer. And uh, I, I know you were wanting to talk about pointing out how security research is becoming more and more accessible than it was perhaps in uh, you know the old days when you had to climb the mountains to go to school. Uh, I'm not sure if I'd say more accessible. Um, I think there's there's more information out there for sure, but I don't think it was like some inaccessible thing um, years ago either. More what I want to point out is it feels like, had you asked me, you know, when I got started professionally uh, close to 10 years ago, like about binary security, which I, while I wasn't quite working doing that, um, it was it was part of the work, but not super common. There's definitely kind of the general feeling that binary security is kind of dying out. Um, and 
that's still a thought right now. But he, being around in the last like five, six years, there has been a huge influx of, I mean, I'm not that old, but younger people kind of jumping into it, just jumping right into the binary stuff, not going through web, not going through pen testing, just jumping right into like, maybe starting from game hacking. We kind of talked about where people got started on um, our last discussion video with Drogi, just about working in the industry. Uh, so that's kind of why I want to call like there's a huge growth, I think, happening among vulnerability research that's happening from people that are a lot younger than you would necessarily think. Uh, so that's all I really want to call it here. He calls out that he is Generation Z. Oh, man, <laughs> you know, it, it's just I mean, it's great to see more people getting into it because it did feel like it was dying for a while. But I definitely don't feel that way anymore. I mean, I see a ton of people far younger than me who know far more than me. I don't think it'll ever die. Like, even if practical attacks from the binary side start to become uh, less and less viable as time goes on, there's always going to be that mysterious, um, you know, cool factor to it that just won't disappear. So even if maybe it disappears from the professional world at some point, which I, I don't think that'll happen either, but even if you argue that it could, um, it'll still exist in like hobby spaces. So, yeah, I don't think it's ever really going to die completely, but it was dying in terms of the interest. Like there weren't a lot of people really actively talking about it, actively learning about it versus going towards the more, the more sexy job of pen testing has all seen an explosion of interest, although that's been going on longer. Yeah. Now, one last thing I wanted to point out before we move on was uh, there was a like new type of bug, I guess, or at least new to me that was pointed out. Um, I'm not going to go through all the bugs or like a full analysis of the bug in question, but it was a user land bug, which they used to gain privileges and uh, access to more attack surface. And I believe slide 64 kind of has what I want to point out here. Um, it was basically a UAF due to the ability to pass an arbitrary selector into Objective-C objects. And what they have in the vulnerability takeaway is um, it perfectly demonstrated a special weakness pattern of using Objective-C, which sort of like an Java JavaScript, um, the user input string may execute unexpected methods. Um, so they have like some keywords of things you want to look out for, like NS selector from string or method for selector. Now I'm not like I'm not an Objective C enthusiast or anything. I've written some of it before and I didn't like it, <laughs> but um, I feel like this is something that other researchers can keep a lookout for. And there's probably more issues that are like this in other system daemons. Um, and they even dropped two other zero day bugs in uh, the Dmod helper and profile D daemons. Uh, the Dmod D helper they mentioned could actually lead to a highly reliable exploit. Um, the second one could be good for persistence, but it wouldn't be easy to exploit due to mitigations. But mostly what I just wanted to point that out for is the fact that this is uh, one of those things you can take away from the presentation and isn't going to be suddenly irrelevant when the bug is patched, because it's, it's likely this type of issue is going to be found in more areas. So if you're looking at like iOS system daemons or something, this is probably good to put on like a cheat sheet or something. So kernel exploitation with a file system fuzzer. This is our last hack in the box topic. Um, so this is for fuzzing file systems for Linux kernel exploits. Uh, this is based on a project uh, they developed called Janus, I believe it's called, to fuzz file systems. So by file systems, we mean like um, ext4, ntfs, zfs. Stuff like that, although Sorry, not was NTFS, Janus obviously. theirs? I know they referenced Janus. I'm not sure if it was their project, because that's from 2019. It so, was uh, Fuzzer. I'm not sure if it was theirs, though. Okay, maybe you're right that it was something they were referencing. Why I thought it was theirs cause it was because they do reference it a lot. Like, they have it in... I think they had it in, like, three different slides, and they give, like, an overview of how that Fuzzer works. Yeah, they're definitely building off of what Janus did. Yeah. Um... But while fuzzing, they discovered some stats which offer some good insights, I think. Uh, when you go to page 34, they have this breakdown uh, across ext4, f2fs, and btrfs of the CV CVE ratio by vulnerability type. 
Um, so they they broke the CDEs into classes of null deref, UAF, and uh, out of bounds access, and they found a thirty thirty split between null deref and UAF, and then the final forty percent going to the out of bounds access. Um, so those were kind of interesting insights to me. Um, I was surprised how low the percentage of null dereferences was. Like I thought there'd be more null dereferences compared to use after free and out of bounds access. Um, but at the same time, out of bounds access being the most prevalent type of issue kind of makes sense too when you're talking about file systems. You're talking about buffers and size and length tracking. That's a huge part of what file systems are designed to do. So it, it kind of, I guess it's kind of obvious in hindsight that that's the most likely kind of code that's going to get screwed up. And there's not as much memory allocation happening uh, as perhaps some other subsystems. So I guess that that vulnerability breakdown makes sense when you really think about it. Um, they do do an analysis of a good chunk of those CVEs, which we're not going to get into because we would be here until like next Monday. Um, yeah, they that, go through that a would lot. Be pretty dry. Um, but what I really liked about this presentation is they do have this focus on the crash analysis. That's one of those topics that I have absolutely no resource to recommend somebody like, how do I do triaging? How do I do that crash analysis? Like root cause not... analysis. Yeah, it's yeah. like you just have to go and do it. I have no references to say this is kind of the things that you can look for. Just you have to kind of go and do it a bit. Uh, so I really appreciate the fact they do kind of talk through a few of these issues like they have their crash analysis talk through a little bit about what they figured out and whether or not they think it's exploitable, giving some of them this internal exploitability score. And like, I think that can be really useful just to see that thought process that exists. Uh, because like, I honestly don't know any good resources for that. There probably is somebody somewhere that's done training on it. I haven't really gone actively looking for it, but it definitely is one of those skills that it's hard to teach without just like, getting your hands dirty and doing it. So I really appreciate seeing that section in here. Uh, one last section I wanted to point out was uh, slide 71 and onward. They have this section for generic kernel exploitation. Um, and they talk about various mitigations like secure or supervisor mode access prevention, supervisor mode execution prevention. And they talk about like how those two mitigations can be bypassed. Um, so some of them we've talked about before, like smashing the control register, um, changing register values via ROP, rep 2 dir which is actually a new term to me, which I didn't know of. It's essentially overwriting kernel data, um, like targeting synonyms of user control data within the FizzMap area. So you're abusing the physical memory and virtual memory divide. Um, this this stack is like really new to me. I, I don't know much about it. Um, so that was kind of a nice takeaway for me personally from these slides. Uh, but th they talk about some other mitigations too, like KASLR, and uh, some heat spraying techniques, though these are really just summarizing ones that have been known for a while. Uh, there weren't any new ones, at least to me, in there. But um, it, it's just a summary. But like you said, it is a it's a good summary. Yeah, it, it's a good resource to have if you're looking at kernel exploitation, and even if you don't care about the file system stuff that they talk about earlier, this stuff can be applied elsewhere. So that that's kind of a nice thing you can take away. Unfortunately, with these slides you can't pull as much out of them without the audio as the last one, I think. Um, you can tell they were designed to complement the presentation more. Like, there's a lot of, like, duplicated slides with, like, different things highlighted and stuff, which you can tell there's no notes on the slide, but they would be talking about it on in the actual conference presentation. So without that context, there's a lot of information that you, you don't get with just the slides. Um, still, though, there's definitely some stuff here you can you can read and, and get out of. Um, but I think if you find this these slides interesting, you would definitely want to make sure to revisit it later when the talk goes out, because um, there's there's a lot of stuff missing when you don't get that that voice context uh, more so than the last uh, set of slides we covered. So research, we'll we'll move into our research section, which is our last section of the episode. Um, We'll start off with Graybox automated exploit generation for heap overflows and language interpreters. I would say mouthful. Um, so this is a PhD thesis around uh, Graybox automatic exploit generation. So the thesis is really long. Uh, it's 147 pages. I believe the gist of it is they have uh, they have like a few sets of tools. I think they have Sieve, Strike, and Gollum. I think Gollum is like the 
the main thing that ties it all together. Yeah, and I think um, Gollum was actually isn't his. Um, I thought it was, but it was a different white paper that he published yeah, earlier. Yeah, there, there's a different white paper, so I don't believe that's his, but he based some of this on that, perhaps. Okay. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure about that, because yeah, he does kind of talk about a lot of this, so it's his, and then he references another paper for Gollum in particular. So I think that Shrike and Sieve is, are his two main contributors here. Um, And I guess I'll just dump into going into it. Uh, what this is going for is the automatic generation of heap overflow exploits. So he's not looking for the vulnerabilities. In this case, it's you've got a vulnerability. Now, how do you exploit it? The challenge with the heap overflows is um, you can either target where you overflow and you overwrite some of the metadata that's stored between heap chunks. Um, that's where you attack the allocator, you know, the house of whatever attacks for the glibc stuff. Uh, that would be kind of that. He's not going that route. Instead, he's looking at overflowing in the heap, overflowing into another block and writing the data there. So that's where you kind of got to do that little bit of feng shui, a little bit of heap manipulation to get the blocks that you want next to each other, or at least close enough together for you to overwrite values that you want. Uh, which is where the sieve comes in, or sev, I'm not sure, uh, which is kind of two things, a driver and a framework. A driver, you can link it up with any allocator that exposes like malloc free, call lock, and real lock. Um, and all it does is it takes an input file specifying a series of allocation and deallocation requests. And the output is just the distance between two particular allocations of interest. Um, then the framework is a Python API for actually running kind of experiments of different heap manipulations. Uh, so this is, he's kind of introducing sort of fuzzing to try and find the right heap manipulations to perform in order to get the data you want where you want it. Which is kind of an interesting take on this, um, because there is a lot of a lot of wiggle room for what you might be able to control in the heap if you actually kind of play around and try different things. Now obviously you can't really you don't usually have direct control over I'm going to do this allocation then this allocation. Like usually they're in groups. You've got like a function that might do a particular series. Uh, so that's where you've got the Shrike, which is specifically for the PHP interpreter, but this idea definitely applies elsewhere, which has a component that just identifies fragments that provide some of these distinct sequences and then uses those, fuzzes that to kind of do a randomized search to find an input that actually gives you a uh, primitive that you would want, which is partially where Golem comes in to discover the primitives for either an IP hijack or a memory write. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to apply fuzzing to this. Because um, it does, like initially you think, well, because you need this exact layout, maybe fuzzing isn't the best way to go about it. But then when you think about it a little bit deeper, it's, well, no, there's so many different layouts that will work or could work that fuzzing is actually reasonably likely to give you a good result. Um, and I will also just mention, while Spectre says this is a 147-page thesis, it is, but the text is fairly large compared to a lot of papers we talk about, single column. It wasn't that bad to read through. So there were, I think there were uh, the two tools. So Sieve was the driver for allowing that heap manipulation, and then Shrike was the heap layout problem solver, uh, which took like the, the the templates and stuff and parsed them. Um, but we've talked about some things that fall along this vein before. Like we've talked about Kobe, which was which also talked about um, exploiting, like automating triaging and exploiting of uh heap overflows i believe or out of bounds accesses as they call yeah, them kobe was specifically the out of bound access um it would try and expand what you can do with that figure out what the furthest you could read or write is and stuff like that um yeah. whereas this is the more smashing style of attack uh heap smashing i guess yeah um but one one problem that the researcher mentioned was a lot of the existing solutions when it comes to automated exploit generation only break the exploit generation into two steps, um, which I believe was like finding the bug and then mutating that input that triggered the bug to try to do like a control flow hijack using like SMT solving or whatever. Um, but it doesn't go into the nuances of 
like dealing with the heap layout and manipulating it as much. Um, and then the other thing they mentioned was the fact that previous work didn't touch on the ability of using primitives at all. Um, which is kind of weird because primitives are a, a basic building block of exploitation. They're, they're very like fundamental. So I thought that was kind of interesting that he wanted to improve that aspect. It's really um, fundamental, but it's actually, it, it is somewhat actually kind of the bleeding edge of the vault research to be thinking about it in terms of those primitives of the manual vuln research, at least. Uh, like, that is actually kind of one of the recent changes. Uh, for a while, it's always talking about in terms of the actual attack, the uh, ret to libc, then roth, then things like that. It, was in, it wasn't just talking about the generalized um, gadget that you obtained there, the you've got a IP hijack or mem right. So... I mean, it's definitely been around for a while talking about the gadgets, but I could understand kind of because that's more of a manual approach. Like you've got to be doing it manually to kind of be thinking about that, whereas the automated work just, you know, it doesn't necessarily care about that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the other big point of the solution that he wanted to come up with was he wanted the tools or the various phases, as he, as he called them. Um, the way of solving them, he wanted them to be hot swappable. So if like a human wanted to take over that stage, or if a better automated solution came along down the line, um, that way it could just be dropped in without reworking the entire setup to make it work. So basically making it modular, which I thought was nice. Um, I, I think why I really like this paper and like some of the solutions in it was when you're talking about academia, there's a lot of really cool concepts and then the execution just kind of sucks um they they don't really think about how this could actually be used or any of the practical aspects of it um like if you try to build like a, a project that's mentioned in a white paper or something you're probably gonna have a hell of a time because it, it's it's the classic works on my machine uh you know mantra whereas here you can see he's he has um that setup and wanting to keep it modular in mind so uh, like, I really like that because it's not something you, you often see out of academia. Um, and I think this type of research is probably the next big step for automated uh, vulnerability hunting and triaging. Uh, I think I said something similar with Kobe. Triaging is the biggest problem right now when it comes to fuzzing. Um, you can have a fuzzer that spits out a thousand bugs a day. If that ends up flooding a maintainer's email and they don't know which ones to prioritize, you're actually doing more harm than good because you're flooding them with garbage. Like, for example, if you are if you have, like, a bunch of null pointer D references, like, put that in the dumpster. Nobody cares about those. Like, okay, sure, you have a DOS. Cool. Um, You're not going to be able to do anything with that. Whereas if you have, like, a, you know, a heap overflow that has a demonstrated exploitability, which is something that this, this project aims to provide, um, that makes it a much more higher impact issue that needs to jump to the top of the list. Um, and that that's like the biggest area that's lacking in automated fuzzing setups right now is that triaging because the manual human effort that's involved with that is just kind of incredible and seems to be forgotten by people who run these fuzzers. So um, yeah, I think an automated approach is the way to go and it is where we'll see like the biggest improvements in the near future. Yeah, and I really like that this one doesn't say it makes it uh, modular, makes things uh, composable. It's not necessarily going to remove the human from the vulnerability researcher, which is a huge ask, but rather being a tool that can assist the researcher in doing it, uh, still having a place for the researcher to kind of get in there and actually use the human intelligence to do some of this. I, I think it's, it's kind of what I like to see right now. I don't think we're at the point where we just have tools taking over absolutely everything. They even talk about the cyber grant challenge from DARPA uh, that recently that ended, you know, a couple years ago or whatever, um, where it was doing automatic exploit generation, like finding them, exploiting them, and patching them. Um, and a lot of them were just really based around uh, stack overflows, like straightforward classic style. And I mean, a lot of vulnerabilities being found these days aren't the classic stack overflows anymore. It's use after phrase. It's uh more complex it's you know these heap overflows they're more complex to actually take advantage of and you still need a human in the loop so i definitely appreciate that this one considered the human in the loop 
I think that's kind of a big area to, you know, make it easier for the human rather than just trying to replace the human. You know, I can't, like, thinking about it, I can't actually think of the last time I've seen a straight-up Stack Overflow in a real-world application that was actually exploited. Um, because not only do you have the aspect of those basically being extinct as vulnerabilities because they've been hunted down and picked over so much, but you also have the fact that even if you do find one, uh, if it's a straight up stack smash and the application has heap cookies, you're screwed. Uh, you're not exploiting that pretty much. Um, heap cookies have kind of, they, they've really kind of killed that class of attacks. Um, well, if you've got like a read gadget, you should be able to read the gadget. Or, I mean, I was actually talking with somebody about bypassing uh, Zach Canaries just a couple nights ago, uh, where they were able to get around to using brute force uh, because, um, in certain cases, the canary will only be regenerated per boot, like every time you start the application. Um, and if it's something like a forking server, that means it's not, depending on implementation, it's not necessarily regenerating the cookie every time it crashes, which means you can have multiple attempts. So there's definitely ways to get around the canaries. It's just um, not ideal. Like most of the time, people just, they just want to find a different, more powerful bug class and just have to uh, avoid having that dependency altogether if they can. Yeah, but like I was saying, with the memory read aspect, like, you often need to deal with ASLR anyhow, so you're very likely to have a memory read. It might not be arbitrary, you might not be able to use it for the canaries, but it's some of them, you might be able to read that stack information, so you might have a vulnerability that already works that you're using for ASLR that you can also use for the canary. So, like, I, I just wouldn't be so hard on saying... If you've got this, if you've got a stack smash and there's canaries, you're not exploiting it. No, perhaps I worded that too strongly, but I mean, what I was trying to get at there was the fact that stack canaries exist plus the rarity of finding stack uh, bugs. It's just, I haven't seen any, like, have you, have you seen any like major applications in the last like year that have had a stack overflow exploited? I want to say we've talked about something with Valve that had a stack overflow. I'm not sure if we talked about it on episode or not. I mm. want to say there's something like that. I feel like I've seen them, but I couldn't actually tell you, like, yes, this was where I've seen it uh, recently. Yeah, but it's definitely one of those classes that's it's kind of falling in popularity. Maybe FileZilla, as we were talking about earlier. Although, like <laughs> I said, I think that's just stack exhaustion. Yeah, and that, that is another case where even if it was a stack overflow, you probably wouldn't be able to exploit it or at least not without another bug, so. So Intel, uh, Intel published a security white paper regarding CSME, the Converged Security and Management Engine. Um, this is basically an overview of what CSME is and the security features it has. I, I don't think we'll get into the contents too much, but I think the table of contents gives you a pretty good overview of what's contained inside of the white paper. Um, it, it talks about like the fuse encryption key, uh, the flow of secure boot, the main security principles of the OS. So like uh, protecting access to those keys, uh, enabling firmware code integrity at boot time and runtime, protecting modules from each other and their data and, and the spy flash and isolating privileges. Yeah, um, like the CSME here kind of took some popularity or got noticed because of the ME exploits. I want to say year, year or two ago that were like basically backdoor root access to like all the Intel machines out there for a while. Yeah, there wasn't really any documentation about what the heck this management engine was. Uh, so this is, I believe, the first time that Intel is actually documenting some of the security that At exists least there. Yeah, that's publicly documented. They've probably had it internal for a while. So that's why I wanted to shout it out. We're obviously not going to cover everything um, on this. I just wanted to shout out that they did drop this information. It is kind of available. And if you want to know more about Intel, uh, the management engine, you can. Yeah, usually Intel keeps anything, especially security related, uh, to its products really close to their chest. Um, they're a really close company in that respect. I mean, how many times in the past have we covered Intel advisories and had to be like, we'd love to cover more, but there's basically no in technical information here. Um, that that's not by accident. That's by design. Um, Intel. They're also like this. This type of documentation has probably been available to people who signed NDAs and stuff in the past which obviously sucks because anybody in the public is not ever going to see that information. So it's nice to be able to see at least something come out from Intel. So that, that's kind of why we wanted to shit it out there. Um, 
when when they do put stuff out there, it, it's worth checking out. So, but yeah, we're we're not really going to cover the contents of it too much. Uh, that being said, that pretty much sums up all of our topics. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. You can catch the VODs on Twitch or on YouTube at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday after the stream. We also have previous podcasts up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, and more links on Anchor. If you want to join the community, you can go ahead and join our Discord. You can find the link in chat or in the description of the video. Uh, keep a lookout for the discussion video that's dropping this Thursday with Drugi. And then we'll be back again next Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. And we will see you all then. Yeah, and I'm just going to add before we leave, if you made it all the way to the end here, thank you for listening. And um, we are trying to get some feedback. So you know, so we're trying to cut our episodes a little bit shorter uh, so that we have created a feedback channel over on Discord. If there are things that you like from the episode parts that you wouldn't want us to cut out or make shorter, uh, let us know. Or parts that you really don't care about. I mean, let us know as we're trying to uh, change how we do our episodes to basically get the content that actually matters to you guys out there. Yeah, thank you guys for listening and we'll see you next time.